Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 28th. First up, this is from, well, first before I get started on the articles, uh, some of you probably heard, maybe most of you have heard, Leonard Nimoy passed away at the age of 83, one of my favorite characters on Star Trek, the original series. Probably a reason why a lot of people got interested in science, and even NASA scientists say that's one of the reasons why they decided to become rocket engineers was because of uh, either certain characters on Star Trek or the Star Trek uh, TV show itself. So first up, uh, from the conversation, NASA missions may reevaluate Pluto and Ceres from dwarf planets to full-on planet status. Um, this is something I've been kind of like thinking about myself too, the fact that I really believe if they're going to call planets like, the if you look at the difference between Jupiter and Earth, how different they are, basically they're just round shaped. I mean, one's a gas giant and uh, the only other really similarity is they circle the sun. So I'm beginning to think that maybe for the definition of a planet, you probably should consider any body that is large enough to be spheric spherical shape and uh, its main orbit is around the sun. And then any other uh, objects that are, uh, their main orbits are around the planets, call them moons. So anyway, the Dawn spacecraft is going to be visiting Ceres on March 6th. They're already getting some pretty good pictures. I'll put one of the pictures up of Ceres. That's the one... Um, dwarf planet in the asteroid belt that is large enough to become spherical and then come July the New Horizons spacecraft is going to go to Pluto and they're thinking because of the information the New Horizons craft may learn as it arrives and does a little bit more exploration of Pluto may give impetus for this uh, group of people to actually bring Pluto back into the uh, category of a full-on planet along with possibly Ceres too. Uh, the scientists talk about the fact the argument that um, the scientists used was the fact that to be a planet they wanted the planet to have cleared out its immediate area of uh, clutter and debris and since uh, they said Pluto didn't do that being that it's a Kyber belt object and it didn't really clear off clear off enough of the Kyber belt but they argue on the other hand if you were to stick Earth in the Jupiter in uh, Pluto's orbit or in the Kyber belt the Earth probably wouldn't have at this time um, cleared out. I mean, obviously it wouldn't be habitable, but it would not have cleared out its immediate area of debris and stuff like that. So would you all of a sudden uh, call Earth a dwarf planet or, you know, give it another designation or something like that? So I think it makes a lot of sense, and it's a pretty cool article here. Um, plus, uh, coming up in 2015 with two different visits, too, uh, one to the asteroid belt and one to uh, Pluto to check out the planet, it's going to be a really interesting year in astronomy. So if you get a chance to check that out. This next one, it's more or less a video. I'll play some excerpts from the video here. This was sent by Navy Thomas 8, U.S. Military's Heat Ray. This is from CNN.com. This is something that has been around for quite a while. Basically, all it is is just a, a high-powered microwave dish that beams radio waves that can heat up people's skin and make it uncomfortable. But what they're working on now is making it smaller and more portable to be able to use it maybe in crowd control or something like that. Um, I have a little bit, it, it still probably would be basically effective, but it would also be very easily um, countered, you know, when they do have uh, protests and stuff like that, and they lob smoke grenades or tear gas bombs, the protesters, a lot of them bring along gas masks. Well, if you're talking about microwave beams, you could have a rolled up piece of cardboard with aluminum foil on one side, and that would basically pretty much protect you from all of the heat rays. It cannot penetrate. I mean, microwave just cannot penetrate even a, a thin layer of aluminum foil. So how effective this will be in future crowd control um, kind of remains to be seen. And next, this is an article from the New York Times, Building a Face and a Case on DNA. I'll just read a little bit of this. There was no known eyewitnesses to a murder of a young woman and her three-year-old daughter four years ago. No security cameras caught a figure. Nonetheless, police in Columbia, South Carolina last month released a sketch of a possible suspect. Rather than an artist's rendering based on a witness description, the face was generated by a computer relying solely on DNA found at the scene of the crime. So basically, they can get enough characteristics of it. They say they can tell now with DNA pretty easily what kind of hair you have, what your hair color is, what your eye color is. Um, I don't know if it, they didn't talk about how, if they could tell about how average your height could be, but I'm sure they're working on that too. <clears throat> they, they said some people are, say it's raising concerns because they question that it could be used for racial profiling, but to me it's kind of like this would kind of defeat that. It would be the exact opposite because 
um, instead of just naturally accusing some minority because it's a minority neighborhood saying it's a Hispanic or a black that did the crime, you would be able to check the DNA and say, no, it definitely wasn't. And if it happened to be a minority, you would be targeting the, a description of the subject that would be accurate. So I think, if anything, it would actually uh, allay some of the concerns of the profiling and stuff like that. But that's just my opinion of it. So <clears throat> if you get a chance, check this out. And they've got the uh, snapshot that they generated and stuff like that for us. So it's, uh, it's a new technology, and uh, it might be really scary accurate as far as, you know, as far as uh, what it can possibly do in the future. So uh, I don't see anything in here about this one actually saying that they actually uh, found anybody in this case or anything like that. So all they have is just a picture and stuff like that, but uh, nothing about that they actually captured a, su a, sub a suspect for this uh, particular case. So, But it's a new technology. I mean, when stuff, are, when stuff is new like that, you kind of got to expect that. And in technology, too, I don't know if you guys have noticed your browsers may be working a little bit different or a little bit more effectively. We're coming up with two new standards. Uh, well, not newer, but you know some of the implementations of these standards. You've got HTTP2 coming up. It's uh, not quite totally functional in Google Chrome yet, and also uh, not quite completely functional in uh, what's the Fox, Firefox version 36, I believe, is the newest one that came out. But some of the functions are actually happening, and the the thing that'll be most notable to a lot of people that use browsers is a lot of times you'll load a web page and it'll get stuck and then you refresh it and all of a sudden boom the web page is all there and complete well this new HTTP2 standard actually does not make the data wait in line for the data ahead of it to happen before it loads the next piece of data it'll actually do it in parallel so basically if one little part of the web page isn't loading correctly it'll just keep on loading the rest of the web page and it'll ask again for the other piece so for most people, they'll notice their web pages. Uh, if they've had a problem with web pages semi-loading, this should take care of that problem. HTTP2 is fully implemented on all the browsers. And the other one I'm liking myself, and this is on Firefox, it's HTML5 for video. I got the plug-in. They were said originally that version 36 was supposed to have HTML5 for playing videos, especially on YouTube, but you do still have to do it through a plug-in. I'll give you the link down below if you want to get that plug-in to be able to do that, but I'm, maybe pretty soon they'll actually do it natively. But what happens is all of my buffering issues went away. Adobe Flash, just it's always been just a headache to deal with on YouTube videos especially. It uh, crashes, it hangs up. I, I always have buffering problems with it since I've switched to this HTML5 version plug-in on my Firefox, and I guess Chrome does it natively. One of the reasons why I don't use the Chrome so much, though, is they don't have the variety of plugins I like, and it uses a lot of resources. So when you're using the Chrome browser, um, it takes up a lot of computer resources. So if you're a multitasker, it doesn't work quite as good for us. But anyway, with this HTML5 plugin, it just it made YouTube much more pleasant to deal with. So if you get a chance to check this out, I'll put the wiki links to it of what's going on. And there's also a video I'll post of a guy um, that talked about some of the new uh, implementations on HTTP2. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. Um, I will catch you next week. And thanks, for, thanks by the way, for sending in all the material. Thank you, Navy Thomas 8, for the U.S. military's heat ray sending in. Um, please continue to do so. It makes my show a lot easier to do. So I will catch you next week.